It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with May Brussel. For the past 14 years, May has been researching and uncovering facts and evidence from between the lines of the news and placing them in a more thorough perspective of how conspiracy, political assassination, and abuses of power affect us all. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. And now, May Brussel. The pleasant and the unpleasant. Uh, I was just told to start again. <laughs> the cassette is going for those of you who have it, but we didn't cue this right. It's Dialogue Conspiracy number 300. It's May Brussel in Carmel, California, December 18th. 1977. I have a guest this evening who's going to be speaking about the Savak, the Shah of Iran, and the demonstrations in Washington, and what has happened to the uh, people in the United States who have suffered as a result of his visit, and what's happening in Iran right at the present time, right up to the time that we went on the air. Before we get to that, I do want to say that Dialogue Conspiracy will be going into some subjects, their listeners back east in Minneapolis, Florida, and around the country, they've sent me some fantastic information. Uh, one of them is the connection of the Church of Rome, the Jesuits, the Catholic connection to the Abraham Lincoln assassination. I have uh, several hundred pages on the Son of Sam, and I'll relate that to the Los Angeles Strangler murders that are taking place within a few weeks. These are shows to come. and. I'll be doing uh, some broadcasts on the Minneapolis-Minnesota connections to what I call the Nazification of America. We've done the Pennsylvania CIA connections, and I'll be naming certain agents and institutions in Minneapolis and Minnesota uh, comparisons to various cities that are being taken over. And I have had a request from a listener to go into the Gemstone file. That's a file on the uh, takeover of America of organized crime and narcotics with the CIA. I got the original gemstone file from Bruce Roberts. It's circulating all over the world, and they want to make a movie out of it from London. I'm the only person in the United States that has the entire file, and it's 300 pages. It was given to me, and a summary of it is going to almost every city, uh, major city in the country, and many of you do have the summary of the file. I'll go into it at length shortly in a few weeks. I do have copies. They're not at my home. They're located out of the country, three complete sets of these hundreds of pages that are answers to many of the questions people have been asking. And we'll talk about Bruce Roberts. The man who wrote the gemstone file died of a brain tumor about six months ago. I also uh, want to uh, thank people for sending in these various books and papers on other subjects that I don't have time to mention. My desks are literally piled with these uh, pieces of information, and I will use them from time to time if the little patients will get to it. Now back to my guest here this evening. Uh, I want to say as a way of introduction that there is one overriding theme of Dialogue Conspiracy that I have been emphasizing for the past six years, and that is the corporation funding of Adolf Hitler before World War II, right after World War I, and then the creation of fascism all over the world after World War II. When Hitler lost the war, the top Nazis were distributed all over the entire world. And this renewed funding and creation of Nazism is causing systematic murder of persons that I describe each week in Dialogue Conspiracy and the witnesses to these murders. The mastermind for this Nazification was originally the Tsarist Russians working with French, Dutch, Dutch, and English oil companies and Americans. And after World War II, they combined with organized crime and uh, went into worldwide narcotics traffic. The effect of the Nazification uh, is exemplified in a new book, which is coming out. Uh, I just heard about it from the London Guardian. It's a book about Martin Bormann, and an introduction of, to this book describes the fact that two questions are in everybody's mind. Where is Martin Bormann, and who killed John Kennedy? And now a new book is coming out called Treason for My Daily Bread by Mikhail Lebedev, a Russian who became a Nazi, he helped Martin Borman escape. I have the escape routes that he's listed that are identical to the other sources that I've had uh, previously. And uh, he's going to tell that an agent, a uh, particular agent uh, by name, 
did the fatal head wound that blew off the head of John Kennedy and that the murder was ordered by none other than Martin Bormann, the man that masterminded the person known as Adolf Hitler. I believe I'm the only person in the world that has published articles and talked continuously on the radio shows of the link of the Bormann Brotherhood to the Nazification of America and the assassination of John Kennedy. The man called Zed who did the fatal headshot for which Lee Harvey Oswald was the patsy or fall guy used a .45 bullet, which is a heavy bullet, enough to blow out the brains of John Kennedy. So the links of Argentine and Germany and Texas, Washington, Mexico, the CIA, are being put together. New books are coming out all of the time, and I'm looking forward to that book. And when we talk about murders and assassinations in this country, particularly around the world, uh, we talk about it as a figure of speech. We haven't suffered at the hands of this oppression. We really don't know what it is in this country, like uh, the people that have been in other countries or have relatives in other countries, such as Chile or Iran, and uh, experiencing this repression. So tonight, I have this guest who's going to speak with us about what it is to have the Nazification of the country in her own hometown. Now, for very good reasons. We're not going to identify you by name. I think that's fair. <laughs> we agreed uh, she doesn't want the Savak on her tail in this country. So I will, do you want to make up a name that I will call you by or should we just start talking? We can just start talking. We'll just start. <laughs> this, this guest is a young woman, an organizer. She was in Washington at the time of demonstrations. She helps get out a newsletter. They have 80 chapters around the United States. And she wants to talk about Iran and the murders since the Shah was here and the repressions. Oh, that's right. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been publicized by the United States media for the American people, which is very false, is that uh, Carter is for human rights. I think this was pr pretty much was exposed when Carter came out very blatantly and uh, supported the Shah and stated that as, for, as far as we are concerned, human rights in Iran are not important for us. What is important is the strategic and economic importance of, of Iran for the United States and also stated that they have uh, absolute, uh, state, uh, the United States gives absolute support to the Shah's regime, which is uh, a dictatorship that everyone knows and is supposed to be one of the top, uh, so-called top dictatorships around the world, along with Chile. And uh, so uh, this was pretty much ex uh, exposed during that visit. But uh, the important thing is that uh, immediately after the return of the Shah to Iran, tremendous uh, development as far as repression took place. Uh, there have been mass demonstrations inside Iran, and there, uh, there have been uh, 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 strikes by the workers. The bazaars in Iran where the small businessmen uh, work have been closed, but at the same time there have been f formed armed gangs of Savak agents uh, by the Shah's regime who have been attacking the demonstrators who have been attacking students, uh, workers, uh, peasants, the small businessmen with uh, chains, knives, uh, brass knuckles. Didn't you say everything. 63 people have been killed that's right. since the Shah and was here? That's right. And the result of these have been at least, 60, uh, at 63 least that people you know. that we know of. Was the excuse for meeting, you mentioned that uh, there were poetry readings where as many as 10,000 no, people? Some of these, yes. Some of these took place during uh, poetry readings, which took place on uh, seven nights in a row where uh, some of these poetry nights, there were as many as 10,000 people who came to hear these poets. Uh, these were progressive poets. They were anti the Shah's regime, and they basically read uh, political po poetry. And uh, after th uh, the seven nights, uh, these people were, not, were no longer able to get a place to hold their meetings, so they went to a, a vacant lot <coughs> and had a called for a poetry reading. And on that night, 25,000 people came to hear the poems. Uh, and then uh, at each time, almost every case, uh, the Savak agents and the troops attacked the, dem uh, the people who had come to hear the poem. poem. Were they really uh, out there testing Jimmy Carter's human rights? Do you think they were putting it to a test, or, or do they... Uh, uh, were protesting in a way his visit to the United States to get more arms. Uh, no, you mean the uh, the people? Yeah. Why the uh -huh. people? Why were at this time? Do they always meet in such large numbers at this time? No, there. Uh, the reason that this is happening 
uh, is not basically because of uh, Carter. In fact, uh, Carter was a second secondary reason. It's not even actually a m- main reason. What it, it was is because of the situation inside Iran. Uh-huh. Uh, Iran economically and politically is in very, very deep crisis as a result of its dependence on the United, the United States, which you know we can go and you know I can give some facts about the depend the nature of the dependence. I'd like to uh, emphasize the amount of terror that the people are feeling there, the insecurities right. and the murders. Yeah, like uh, as far as uh, just to give an ex- some examples of the nature of the repression in Iran, there are 100,000 political prisoners in Iran. I think this is the largest number of political prisoners in a country that is not at war with another country. You know, uh, It's a country that is supposedly uh, in, uh, in peacetime situation, but there are 100,000 political prisoners. I think the closest country that comes to it is Indonesia. And uh, within the last uh, several years, 500 people have been executed after closed military trials. Uh, There have been a great number of people uh, killed under torture. And then uh, for the last three years, uh, the system of search and uh, destroy missions have taken place, where Sovak agents in the middle of the night will burst into the homes of the people, search the uh, the area, and arrest anyone that they consider suspicious. And by in trying to surround the homes, they will, if they think there are some revolutionaries in those homes, they will open fire, uh, regardless of whether they're uh, what they think is right or not. And as a result of that, hundreds of just innocent people uh, have been uh, children, women, children, p- old people have been killed on the streets as a result of these uh, search and destroy missions, very much similar to what happened in in Vietnam. So this is uh, just some of the examples of the kinds of repression. Obviously, there are some other things that are obvious, like there is no right for speech, freedom of speech, assembly, right for workers to strike, uh, no freedom of uh, uh, any kinds of media to work, uh, none of these things. No dialogue conspiracy. No dialogue conspiracy <laughs> no. In, in, in any way. Uh, another thing was, uh, like for instance, uh, the, kind, the court system is all yeah. uh, military closed courts. Well, actually, I think it's very much like that in this country. The major cases are cut and dry, and testimony is perjured, and the evidence is falsified and planted. I mean, this is just routine. It, over here, they're more, more sophisticated. They do it covertly over there. They, they do it very o- in the open, very much in the open. The well, I think they're pretty cause. open now, and even, you know, like <laughs> the investigation right. of John Kennedy's uh, right, death. Yeah. But how, what's it like to be a student? You say you have 80 chapters here of uh, Iranian students in the United States. What kind of repressions came down on the students after the Shah visited? Now, this is uh, uh, an interesting thing. Every time after we have a large demonstration, there is uh, immediately a reprisals against our organization. This time, though, it's a little bit different. It's uh, much more serious. It's becoming systematic, and it seems to be, uh, be not just a, peri- a periodic type of thing, but it will be long-range. It will be continuing like this. Since December, uh, since uh, November 15th, We've had so far 30 different cases of harassment in various cities in the in the uh, United States. The kind of harassments have been uh, in one category, for instance. There have been harassments where they've tried to make the cases look uh, non-political, you know, just so-called innocent type of things that have happened. Uh, for instance, uh, expelling students uh, for absenteeism. But when you get into it a little bit more... It was the day of the demonstration. Demonstration, yeah. But how could... They yeah. can't say that's not political. That's very obvious. But uh, they categorize it as, we are expelling you because you were not in school. You know. But the fact is that the reason that they're expelling them, because on the days that they were not in school, like two days or three days that they weren't in school, it was the same day that it was uh, coincided with the Washington demonstration. Could, could those students get other students to stay out of school, say, for three days in January and see if they're not expelled and illustrate? It happens all the time, yeah. Only the Iranian students. The other only American students can cut classes. That's right. But yeah. the, if it was because he was here, that's right. they were expelled. Which states are the hardest? You gave uh, some colleges. Which, where do you think it comes out the hardest? Do you have any record of, uh, uh, of the most harassment in the United States? It's being done uh, pretty much generally now, but... Uh, Obviously, everywhere where we have chapters, but the uh, severest areas have been in uh, Texas, Houston, Texas, in Chicago, in uh, the East Coast, uh, in places where we're having uh, chapters that are newly formed, such as Utah, uh, Logan in Utah, Oklahoma is one of the very uh, severely hit areas as far as harassment and repression. Right now, uh, one case, for instance, which was um, uh, interesting, you, you found it interesting when we talked about it, was in Oklahoma, where uh, they're arresting people who would wa- walk on the streets uh, 
Iranian students on the suspicion that they're Iranians, number one, and the fact that they don't have their passports and their visas on them. And in one case, like uh, a week ago, they arrested three students because they didn't have their passports and their visas on them. And they took them to jail. And then one, when the other people, their friends, brought their passports and their visas and they, they could prove that they were le legally in the United States, the police were forced to release them, but they uh, got fifty uh, forty dollars from each one of the students kept before the they money. kept the money before uh, releasing them. And you yeah. also said the students that went to the demonstrations that have been expelled around the country, then the information that they're no longer students is sent to the Iranian that's right. embassy. That's right. They're they're being sent to and the, the consulates and the immigration. That's right. And then if they're not in college enrolled, they can return them home. Because they're not students, is That's that right. what they do? We are having uh, deportation cases right now all over the United States. Like in, uh, we have a case of 92 students who were arrested in Houston, Texas last year, and the immigration came in and put immigration bonds on the 92 students. And of these 92, they're in immigration court right now, and their cases are coming up uh, several at a time. And four of these students, after the uh, Washington demonstration, the Im immigration just came out and said that they have until the end of December to leave, they're deported. Now, when uh, when students are deported for political reasons and they're, they're deported to Iran, they get uh, it at the other end. Then. That's right. Our Do they go into jail? Oh, yes, our organization is illegal. In uh -huh. 1970, uh, the regime uh, outlawed orga our organization, and they said that any member of the Iranian Student Association would be given three to ten years imprisonment. This was in 1970, and then in 1975. The Shah personally changed that to life imprisonment or execution. If they belong to this organization? To this well, organization what or you any, anything that's uh, politically against the regime. What would happen if you went on the major media or identified yourself by name? What would happen to you when you get back east? Ba um, back Wherever you live. We don't say where. Back I won't Iran. identify where you live. No, in the United States. As far as harassment, you mean? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, well, surveillance is uh, just, you know, rule, tapping of the telephones. Uh, arresting people for any kind of thing, from parking tickets, for instance, and putting on em enormous bonds for just things like that. Like, just give an example. Uh, to trying to prepare for the demonstration in Washington, we were putting posters in around in different cities. And in uh, at least 10 different cities, uh, students were arrested for putting up posters on the, on the walls. And from uh, these people, the bonds put on these people were for $100 in some areas and $1,000 in mm -hmm. other areas. And one case in New York, they were charged with a felony for putting up a poster. You know, yeah, they were followed by were they followed by the New York police or the Savak? Uh, well, by the by the police. Yeah. And of course, the police working hand in hand with, with the Savak by ha giving them information, by giving them photos, uh, fingerprints, uh, any of these information. You know, yeah. so they work together very closely, both the Savak, the police, FBI, CIA. Are you followed? Are you conscious of being followed? At times. Yeah. At times, our phone is uh, pretty badly. They they do a very bad job of tapping telephones. You can tell you can hear your own voice practically being taped. Yeah. But uh, it's important to let the American people know that the, the changes in Iran have to come here. They can't be taking place over there. It was like during World War II, people in Czechoslovakia or Hungary or Poland or France, when Hitler t came in there, uh, the people living there couldn't absolutely move. They were just stymied, and it took the American forces to overturn them. In this case. You have the American forces putting in the fascism. So you have a real problem. You have to take it grassroots to the people and educate them and hope that uh, the way they did in Vietnam, got out in the streets and demonstrated that they support your demonstrations. I have the address of your newspaper. Um, this resistance is a very interesting newspaper. It looks really great. And there's a picture here of Mr. Human Rights and King Torture on the cover. And this whole issue is about the visit of the Shah Iran and st the statistics of his arms uh, payments and what went on in Washington uh, when he visited here in November. I'll give the address on the air for people that want to subscribe to this because in a half hour we can't go into too many details. But if you want information, you could subscribe to this by the year. It's only $3 a year. Uh, there's 16 pages here of information. Uh, this is the address in Chicago is Resistance. Uh, and it's P.O. Box A3575, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. There's a lot of listeners that have their pencils ready because I always give the name <laughs> of books or magazines or things to order, you know, current things. So they're used to my reading off addresses. And if we go too fast, you can always call or write to me and uh, send $3 donation and just get a subscription, maybe ask for the back issues or the current ones. 
There is another office P.O. Box in Berkeley, 4002 Berkeley, California, 94704. Resistance, P.O. Box A3575, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. I personally believe that you can't get the energy into people uh, moving until they're educated. And a lot of people don't have sources of information, like I have many, many articles about Iran, but I've never seen this newspaper. So I'm glad to have this because then I can tap into another source to keep up with what's happening. In the back issues of, of resistance, we have articles on the nature, for instance, of United States military involvement in Iran, on the nature of economic and political involvement in Iran, and the history of U.S.-Iranian relationship, which, uh, uh, including the fact that the United States carried out the CIA coup d'etat in Iran, which brought the present regime to power. Uh, and so uh, if people are interested, we could give them back. Ba ask for a back issue. That's Maybe right. if they send six dollars, they could get a <laughs> subscription to the future and last year's copies. How often do you go to press? Once a month. Once a month. And then after you read this, you might write to Resistance and ask where in your hometown, uh, because this does reach a lot of cities, there is a group that you can attend. And I don't think that Americans should believe it's just for Iranians. I think that they should be there being visible, just like it wasn't the Vietnamese protesting here on the streets. Uh, you should be there supporting these students who uh, are a resistance movement and move on this. There's no excuse for these things happening uh, now with the amount of information that's available. It seems to me that uh, listeners could get their energy and get into these demonstrations and maybe help you in some way in their individual cities. Well, the Americans were very, very helpful to us in our Washington demonstration, and they supported us. And one example was that in many of the restaurants afterwards that we went, they refused to get any, take any money from us when they realized that we were the anti-Shaw demonstrators. Oh, really? That's right. We had cases as far as Oklahoma even that people refused to take money or helped us in any way they could when they realized that we were people involved in the demonstration. And of course, there were a large number of Americans also involved in the demonstration. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, G. Gordon Liddy, one of the Watergate defendants, uh, had said quite openly, this is a war. And he had always been in the National Archives seeing the pictures of the Gestapo and uh, with Robert Marty, and it was very much part of the Hitler movement in the mm -hmm. White House. And a lot of people in this country do not take it as seriously as I do, that there is this war going on, and it's at home, and it's abroad, and uh, it's a continuous effort that you have to mobilize. That's right. Uh, how about the influence of Iran and universities? You're talking about the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, that's right. Uh, one of the uh, things that also contributes to the harassment of the Iranian students in the United States is that the Shah is buying uh, enormous contracts uh, with different uni universities in the United States, like there have been over 70 contracts with different universities and colleges and the uh, regime of the Shah in Iran. And for instance, one in be contract between the uh, Pahlavi University in Iran and uh, the University of Pennsylvania has the clause which states that university of the president of the University of, uh, of Pennsylvania will select the site for the University of Pahlavi in Iran, will select the uh, teachers, the, and will select the books which are written in the United States, they will select the library and the kind of books that are uh, put in the library. They will even select the language which is to be used in the, in, the, in the university, which is being used in the university. The university is open now. And what will America get in return for this? And in educating the Iranians, what uh, is it all oil? Oil and well, opium, no, is that? It's, it's the the ed in trying to educate people to think uh, the way that would be profitable for the American corporations is yeah. basically the most important thing which we call a uh, sort of neocolonization of the uh, Iranian educational system, is to make it uh, fit exactly the kind of system that the United States needs in order to continue its uh, infiltration into Iran. Aside from that, they get a lot of money from the Shah, too. These contracts are bought by millions and millions of dollars worth of money. You know, It's a, it's a recycle process. Well, Iran was a test case for the Central Intelligence Agency. It was formed in 1947 and then in, in 54 when it was overthrown. 53. Uh, 53. Yeah. That's when... Uh, uh, people disguised as priests were pulling machine guns out of their coats and uh, making the overthrow there. And it's been a perfect puppet. I think both of us agree that the Shah is yes, a puppet of the United States. The people don't matter really uh, for what's going on there. They're not considered at all. Uh, as far as the United States is yeah. concerned, absolutely not. Uh, the regime is, uh, is propped up by the m uh, military which everyone knows how much. I think uh, the, the Shah buys 50% of the United States arms sales abroad every year. And in fact, this last year, since Carter came to power, 
uh, he's bought two thirds of the arms uh, of the, the United world. States uh, of the arms that the United States has sold abroad. Two thirds of all of the arms that the United States has sold has been bought by the Shah, by the Shah, and uh, which is um, which is over twenty billion dollars worth, worth of arms. Why do you suppose he's cutting off the agriculture in that country and uh, importing? food from here to there. Yeah, see, uh, Iran was, uh, used to be an agriculture, it is supposed to be still an agriculture country. 65% of the people live by agriculture, but uh, the agriculture has been destroyed because uh, the agribusiness, the large agribusinesses in the United States make a lot of money by uh, exporting their agricultural goods into Iran. So the agriculture in Iran has been destroyed. The peasants have been destroyed. It also makes a dependency of Iran upon exactly. the United States. Exactly. It's opened up a large market uh, for the United States agricultural goods, and at the same time, Iran can't exist without food, and it can't produce its own food, so it's forced to import its food. Well, who can afford so it over there by the time they import it from the uh, United and States? And that's why uh, the, pri the inflation in Iran is one of the uh, highest in the world. It's something like 30 to 40 uh, rate percent inflation per year, and this is, uh, affects everything that has to do with the basic uh, necessities of life in Iran, housing, for instance, uh, average uh, average home in Iran costs a thousand dollars per month. Oh. Know, uh, if you can get it, there's shortages, housing shortage. I I never can figure out how far these people can go or why they want to go that far. What I call this Nazification. I mean, with torture and terror, isn't it possible that if he just turned around 180 degrees and had a home for everybody and school and education, you know, medical needs, he'd be so popular and he could get so much more for his dollar's worth. I don't understand why he wants to accumulate these weapons and be so fearful of the people. I don't know what they get out of it. Well, uh, it's not... He, uh, first of all, he, uh, he is, as we said, a puppet for the United States. And what makes the United States government tick is the profits for the companies. Oh. And whatever pu profit... And for, for to make, in order to make profit, you have to rob the people. And that's the way it works. And, you, and the people don't let pe other people rob them just sitting around, you know, so they have to need, they need arms and repression in order to be able to continue their plunder and robbery of the people. Why yeah. did the Shah let so many students come over here so they'd come back and put money back into his economy, get trained well, in America? He, has, uh, he, has, uh, he doesn't have the system in Iran in order to be able to uh, educate the people. And uh, like, for instance, just to give an example, um, there, uh, the, the entire budget for education in Iran equals 20 F-16s. And the Shah has ordered 300 F-16s, you see. And the, edu the entire educational budget uh, is as much as 20 of the F F uh, F-16 planes that the Shah has bought. So uh, there is no budget to uh, develop the educational system. Just weapons. Yeah. And last year, for instance, there were 325,000 students taking en entrance exams for the colleges, and there were only room for 15,000 students. So what are you going to do with these 310,000 students that, you know, with the, with the yeah. student movement also in Iran being very, very sharp, you okay. know? Now, uh, so. one of the things I do want to say, we have about one minute to go here, is that uh, if people get resistance and write there for information, they can attend demonstrations, they can get educated on the subject. They can get educated in the subject. They don't even need resistance in order to, <laughs> to participate in well, demonstrations. It's, no, I mean, <laughs> if they don't know where they're located, they wouldn't yeah, know right. where to attend. I mean, a lot of times they come spontaneously, and we only know about them because we read that's in the right. morning paper. If they write uh, to resistance, they can get uh, the publication. They can get information on uh, any of their questions that they have or how they can contact us in anywhere in the United States. And, and the problem is to get educated that it's happening and that's take right. some of the responsibility, uh, you Americans who have... Uh, a lot going for us. We really do have and a lot to be grateful for. And we sit back and use the wealth of the corporate structure and let these people be tortured and imprisoned and starving all over the world. But I think the worst example, prime example of the collusion and corruption of the American system is the Shah of Iran. I've always thought that, you know, it was the first baby of Alan Dulles, you know, the That's overthrow. True. And it's been the primary example of torture, repression, uh, greed, mm -hmm. and Nazification of another country after World War II. That's well, right. thank you very much for coming. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm really glad to meet you. Uh, my mm -hmm. guest is out here from the East Coast and has been active in demonstrating. And I appreciate her coming to Dialogue Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. thank you. And maybe when you come back, uh, we'll meet again, or you can send me some tapes or telephone conversations. Sure. And keep me up on what's happening, and then we'll put on the program. Fine, thank you. This is May Russell in Carmel, California, and <laughs> Dialogue Conspiracy. You've been listening to Dialogue Conspiracy with May Russell.